Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Ran a little bit late today. <clears throat> My behavioral health specialist decided to try me on a uh, sleeping pill so I can get some actual sleep. Woke up a little late today. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Last night was first night. We'll see how it goes. Be nice to get some sleep. My body will actually repair itself a little bit. <clears throat> Okay, so this morning we're going to be reading out of Ruth 2.2. 2. Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn. The whole verse says, So Ruth, a Moabitess, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Interesting. Go, my daughter. Well, she was a stepdaughter. Uh, Naomi was a is an image of uh, Israel, and the Moabite is the Ruth is an image of the Gentiles. One would be Israel, one would be the Church. Go, my daughter. I'm just pointing out some interesting things that I've seen before and shared with you guys. Who's the daughter of Israel? <laughs> okay. Ruth meets Boaz, verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Very interesting, because yeah, a lot of people don't see the, the, the shadow, the, the comparisons here, the similarities. Boaz and Ruth are in the line of Jesus. When you go back and it, it, I forget where it's at in the Bible, but it goes and looks at his his heritage, you know, all the people, his whole genealogical line and Ruth and Boaz are in it. Direct descendants. So this book has great importance because of what it's the information it, hold, it holds. And it's in the Bible for a reason. So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field. And glean heads of grain after him, who is who in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, interesting, and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servants, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your, in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Do you see the similarities and the pictures and the connections to everything Jesus said? I mean, like I'm I'm remembering verses from the New Testament where there's similar language going on here. It's 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 amazing. Left father and mother. What you've done for Israel, Naomi, you know. Amazing. Amazing. There's so many similarities in here. I mean, a study in the book of Ruth would take you the rest of your life because there's so much there. Our focus is going to be on gleaning the ears of corn. Downcast and troubled Christian, come and glean today in the broad field of promise. Here we go with the praying promises again, guys. I told you I didn't pull this out of the air. I got it from the Bible. Here are abundance and precious abundance and of precious promises which exactly meet thy wants. Take this one. He will not break the bruised reed, nor quench the smoking flax. Doth not that suit thy case? A reed, helpless, insignificant, and weak. A bruised reed, out of which no music can come. 
weaker than weakness itself. A reed and that reed bruised, yet he will not break thee. But on the contrary, will restore and strengthen thee. Thou art like the smoking flax. No light, no warmth can come from thee, but he will not quench thee. He will blow with his sweet breath of mercy till he fans thee to a flame. Wouldst thou glean another ear? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What soft words? Thy tender, or sorry, thy heart is tender, and the master knows it, and therefore he speaketh so gently to thee. Wilt thou not obey him, and come to him even now? Take another ear of corn. Fear not, thou worm Jacob. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. How canst thou fear with such a wonderful assurance as this? Thou mayest gather ten thousand such golden ears as these. I have blotted out thy sins like a cloud, and like a thick cloud thy, thy transgressions. Or this, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Or this, the spirit of the bride say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whoever will let him take the water of life freely. Our master's field is very rich. Behold the handfuls. These promises are important. They are reminders to us individually and are used as reminders to others. When you come to a place of conviction and you see these promises and they reassure you, change you, strengthen you, embolden you, you take these same promises to others who are struggling too and share them with them. It's part of what I'm doing here so that they may be emboldened and strengthened and built up too. The Lord does this work through all of us. Uh, our master's field is very rich. Behold the handfuls. See there they lie before thee, poor timid believer. Gather them up, make them thine own, for Jesus bids thee take them. Be not afraid, only believe. Grasp these sweet promises, thresh them out by meditation, and feed on them with joy. Guys, praying the promises is not a concept I came up with. Reading the Bible in context, five above, five below, is not something I came up with. Being in the scriptures every single day is not something I came up with. None of these things I tell you did I come up with them. This is stuff the Lord has showed me. And it has been a great benefit to me. And I share not this, these things now with you so that they will be a benefit to you too. What a blessing. What an amazing blessing it is to be able to go right to this source of the living water right to the source of the living bread, right to the source of the blood atonement, and receive fully the promises, the happiness, the peace, the joy that Jesus Christ offers us through these words. There's not one single word in this Bible that, that lacks value. Each word was perfectly chosen and placed by God. And that word has just as much meaning as any other word. And so the arrangement of these words in there, and many have studied this. If you, don't, you have never heard this before, go to Chuck Missler's uh, Koinia House and look at the studies they've done. The mathematical precision of these words is astounding, and the computer technology we have today cannot replicate it in any way. It is impossible. They, they've tried it. They've even had people who are specialists in this estimate what it would take to create the same mathematical precision. And they said, we can't, we don't have the technology to do it. So how did this happen over 2000 years ago? God. So if that's the case with this word, then you know, you can rely on this word. These people out here saying the Bible has been corrupted. Uh, they're, they're morons, they're idiots. And I'm speaking in the actual definition of the word. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about because they don't believe the word of God. They don't study. They don't look at it. So since we are doing that, let us believe what he says. Let us believe his promises. Let us take him at his word and walk in faith concerning it, fully trusting him for all things. That is what all this is meant to, to bestow upon us, a sense of that we can trust him implicitly, that we can take his word at his word, at face value, and run with it. Believe his promises, trust him for what he says he will do. And when we're, when we're downtrodden, when we're struggling, when we're having issues, 
remind him of those promises. Because in doing so, we remind ourselves. Lord, remember when you said this, I take you at your word. I know you will do this. That's how we should be concerning his word every day. The world is doing everything it can to come in between us and his word. Why would they do that? And yet they call themselves Christians. That's amazing to me. Instead, we need to be pushing everybody back to the word. I don't see a lot of channels doing that. I would love to see more channels that go back to the Bible, get back into the word. That's where the truth lies. In this day and age, it's everything but. This is a fight, guys, and it's a fight we're going to win because the Lord already won it. But we a fight we must. We must fight this world in all its attempts to distract us from our true love, our first love, Jesus Christ. And not let anything stand in our way. Because he is our all in all. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. And to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you. Thank you for this holy word. And thank you for this devotion. I thank you, Father, that you have given us this wonderful record of past events. That in many cases speak real time. Apply real time. Predict real time. And that every bit of it was so mathematically perfect. Every bit of it was it has been put in, in its position so perfectly that every single word has meaning. Every single word has value. And it is a living word because it was applicable 2,000 years ago. It's applicable 2,000 years later and all points in between. Speaking present tense. <coughs> and every bit of it, every prophecy, 100% accurate. There's no reason why it shouldn't continue to be so. Father, make us to believe. Make us to trust you. Make us to find your promise, to look and seek through the word, to find your promises you've given. It requires effort on our part to read, but find these things and write them down as a reminder. And then make us to pray them back to you. Again, not to remind you, but to remind us and to encourage us and to strengthen us. The Lord said he would do this. If, he'll, if he said it, he'll do it so that we may remind ourselves and each other of your great and precious promises, of your wonderful provision, of your amazing grace. And even some of the key verses that used to be spouted out constantly are, are not being spouted anymore. Key phrases like, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Hardly anyone talks about it anymore. The love of God surpasses all understanding. So many key verses that are now almost completely ignored. Father, make us to remember and to be Bereans, to study your word and recall within us through the Holy Spirit those things that make the difference, those things that matter, those things that apply in our individual circumstances so that we may come together as a family realizing we're all in the same boat and we're all being having the same word applied to us. And we all have the same promises and the same truths at our disposal. Make us to recognize that you are king. You are God. And this all goes according to your plan, no one else's. So that your truth will reign supreme in our hearts and in our lives. And that no matter what happens, we will not vary or shy away or walk away from that truth, but instead hang on to it for dear life. Because by doing so, we hang on to you for dear life. For your glory, always. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. It, like the stuff I talked about yesterday in that other video, and, and if you go back and look at the comments in there, that same person commented on a different account, the, just the sheer heresy there is. But the common theme between all of those people is the same thing. The Bible is corrupted, really. 
I couldn't disagree more. I think the Bible is truer than it's ever been. And even more applicable than it's ever been. And so when I see people that do that kind of stuff, immediately I'm, no, you, you can't, how, how can you insult God like this and then get cling to be one of his children? That's incorrect. This word, we can trust it. We always have been able to trust it. It's the world that has the problem. Satan knows if he can come between us and God and cause us to not worship him anymore, to not follow and listen to his word. He calls that a win. Well, I say today, we don't let him have that win. I say today, we don't let him have a victory. The, the rankest heresy comes from not believing the Bible is true and not reading it. The greatest deceptions come from not knowing what the scriptures say. That's why the megachurch preachers and the, and the uh, charismatics have such a foothold and make so much money. They're banking on people not knowing what the scriptures say. That person yesterday quoted from the same book they said was improperly, uh, improperly interpreted. Okay. So it's not properly interpreted, but yet you're going to quote from it to, to prove your point. That's hypocrisy. That person's a hypocrite of the highest, highest order. And what's funny is the same verses that person used also condemn them, also contradict them when read in their proper context. It's amazing. Amazing. The world today is, is just rife with narcissism, self-importance. What did Jesus tell us? Don't love self. Give up self. Instead, come to me. And so let us go to him. He's worth it. And he's worthy of our worship. Let us give that to him. And in a day and age when everybody and their brother is putting out videos. And it seems like about 98% of it's wrong. More Now more than ever, we need to be more well-versed in this word. And the only way you're going to do that is to read it. Don't believe me? Read it for yourself. Don't believe someone else? Read it for yourself. Go test it. Because when you do, you realize, wait a minute, what that person just said was wrong. I see what it really says with my own eyes. And there's no magic to understanding the Bible. It's simple comprehension. Read it. What does it say? That's it. There's no mysteries to it. There are only mysteries to those who don't believe and don't know it. The Lord reveals all those mysteries to his children. And since we are his children, he reveals it all to us. Incredible. Let us take every opportunity to read this book, study it, learn it. Because if we're supposed to learn to, to know our Lord and his will, you find all of that in this book. Dedicate time every day to reading the Bible. You'll be glad you did. There's no negative to it. There's only a positive to it. You'll be very glad you did. Because the amount of blessing that is poured out the longer we spend time in this book goes above and beyond anything this world has to offer. Anything. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.